My name is Melissa Stone. I'm one of the financial counsellors at Uniting Kildonan. Uh, we're based in Epping, but we do have offices in Laylor and in um, Collingwood. Uh, we're doing face-to-face -face appointments very soon, but at the moment we do them over the phone. Um, welcome. Today we're talking about mortgages and superannuation and looking specifically at hardship and what your options are at the moment. Um, I'd uh, first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we, or rather Whittlesea is based, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So what is financial counselling? Um, we're fairly little known of, um, and we're trying to make ourselves more well known. Um, unfortunately, it's a service which is um, publicly funded. So those companies out there who want to prey on people who are suffering from debt problems are usually the ones who put money into their names coming up first in Google searches and the likes. But basically what we do is provide information, options and advocacy with creditors um, for anyone who is experiencing financial hardship. It is a free confidential service which is open to absolutely everyone. All of us are trained and accredited with Financial Counselling Australia. Um, we have to maintain our registration, so um, that means keeping up to date with what's happening. Um, it's all about promoting financial well-being. So um, we're not about wealth accumulation. We're about helping those who are in trouble, who are struggling, and coming up with options for keeping your head above water, basically. And we work with you. So we talk about literacy, but we're also into empowerment and making sure that um, while we provide advocacy, hopefully through working together, that um, our clients come out with a feeling of being able to, to do things for themselves. Um, they have the confidence, um, feel that they have the knowledge um, that should something happen in future, that of course they can pick up the phone and talk to creditors without that feeling of perhaps being um, intimidated by um, no named sort of people in suits behind desks. Um, at the end of the day, we believe that you're the expert in your life. So it is very much client driven what we do. Uh, as I said, we're providing the information and the options at, and it's up to you to decide what you would like to do. And then we will, are more than happy to help you on that journey in whatever way we can. So we work together. Um, a lot of what we also do, part of it is um, talking about systemic change. And so we do a lot of work in um, lobbying to government. Um, one of the big things that is going on is trying to keep the rates for job keeper and job seeker um, higher. I, overall, we're not succeeding because we don't have a, a government that's open to that idea at the moment, but that's certainly something that um, we try and do. Um, you might remember that there was a Banking Royal Commission a number of years ago. Pretty much all of the people, the examples, the case studies that came out of that were all filtered up by financial counsellors around Australia. So this is a national um, uh, service. Um, specifically, Kildonan works in the council areas of Whittlesea, Nilambic, Banyul, Darabin and Yarra. Um, but as I said, there are people all over Australia whenever you need help. So drowning in debt, unfortunately, there are too many people out there um, who are experiencing this at the moment. And we understand no one chooses to um, have debt, to feel like they're poverty stricken, that um, they're drowning in debt, um, but all sorts of circumstances occur um, in life to put you in a position where you feel like control over your money is being taken out of your hands. And sometimes you feel that you can't find a way out. One of the first things that we say is that communication 
is the key. Um, as soon as you can get in contact with your creditors, no matter how intimidating it might feel, the better. And the more open they're going to be to solutions proposed either by you or a financial counsellor on your behalf later on, because they like to be kept in the loop. Um, some of the things that can be done, and this is just a general thing, whether we're talking about credit cards, I know we'll get onto mortgages and so on in just a minute, but any type of debt. So credit cards, personal loans, car loans, Centrelink, um, a tax office, um, utility bills. Um, there are always a number of options. Now, one of the big ones that we often go for just initially when we're talking to clients is to get what's called a moratorium. Now, a moratorium is a break, a break from payment. It's usually for a short term, usually about three months. Sometimes we can push it out to six. Sometimes we can push it out to 12 months. We have had success with that in the last year, but that's more to do with um, COVID. The idea with a moratorium is basically to give you a break. Um, it's an understanding that whatever is happening in your life means that you can't make your payments at the moment. So you need time to get back on your feet. For some of those um, types of credit, we do also try to put a hold on interest being attributed can't always do that sometimes it depends on the type of credit that we're talking about but it's basically to get you back on your feet um, and some people just need that um, they need that break from there the sort of things that we talk about with people in terms of dealing with debt are short medium long-term payment plans uh, we work to, with people to find out what their budget is, what is affordable. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that you talk to the creditors and they say, well, you have to pay this. Now, some people feel like they absolutely have to say yes. Otherwise, they're going to lose their house or something like that. They're going to lose their car, whatever it is. No, you don't have to do that. You have to make sure that you're no longer vulnerable that you are still not at risk of losing something and that you are not sacrificing any of the basics. So need to make sure that you do have the roof over your head, the electricity, the water, the gas on, that you've got food on the table, all of those basics. And from there, what we do when we talk to creditors is work out what are viable payment plans going forward. Sometimes we try to put a freeze on accounts, which also means then putting a freeze on interest, in effect, closing them down. Sometimes people don't want that because they still want to draw down from credit cards, from personal loans and so on. It just depends on what your individual choices are. Another thing that we look at are full and final options. A lot of people don't know about these. But if it looks like um, your situation is not going to change, if you happen to have access to a bit of money, um, we can quite often go in and talk to creditors about making a full and final offer. So we present your financial situation and basically say to the creditors, look, this is what we have. This is the pool of money that can be offered. Can we settle this? An example being, that you have a $10,000 debt, say on a credit card, personal loan, if it doesn't look like things are going to change, but you have been able to access a certain amount of money, and people have done that over the last 12 months, particularly through their superannuation, we have gone to creditors and said, basically, there's 6000 there. Can we settle this here and now? And um, a lot of the creditors in recent times, because of COVID, have been welcoming of that, amenable to that. Of course, they end up losing some money sometimes, but it's better than, say, a person going bankrupt and not getting anything. For some people, depending on what their personal situations are, we can look at waivers of varying amounts. Um, there are a lot of people we talk to are in very complex situations. No one chooses to be poor. No one chooses to live in debt. So um, we particularly deal with a lot of um, women who are experiencing family violence, um, all sorts of other hardship where you're talking about different types of 
addiction, including gambling, um, people who have, through no fault of their own, become homeless and so on. So they're all the sort of things that um, we try to juggle um, and make our creditors aware of. So we try to present a human story um, as part of the argument for dealing in a sympathetic, compassionate way with our clients, with you. So that's what I mean about tailored solutions because everyone is different and everyone will be able to have different sorts of things. So what's available to one person will not necessarily be a solution that's available to another. And that's not through a financial counsellor's choice, but rather through the choice of the creditor. So how they would treat someone who is working is different to how they would treat someone who is just on Centrelink benefits. Dare I say also where you are in life will also um, make a huge difference when they're speaking to someone who's quite young, who potentially has a good 20, 30, maybe even 40 years of work in front of them, um, they will be uh, perhaps less lenient in terms of doing things like waivers and so on than someone who is older, has is very close or maybe at the end of their working life or is already um, in retirement. So that's another thing that we talk through in terms of options and solutions. It's very important if you're going to talk to a creditor to know what you want. So communication being the key, Go in, tell them what's happening, tell them what your expect, expectations are as to what will happen in the future and know what you want because they want it to be as easy for them in terms of decision making. That's what we do. We try and put everything together, go in and say, this is the solution that we want. A lot of the time this, they come back and say, no, let's negotiate on this and that's where things go. But if we're very clear, um, they're left with a yes, no decision, and that's what they want. So just going on from there, now we get to mortgages and hardship. Um, and in terms of mortgages, um, people are coming now thanks to COVID uh, to the end of moratorium periods. Um, Certainly the banks uh, weren't, perhaps didn't disclose the situation as much as they should have to begin with. Some people realised that it was a payment break, but not that they were still having interest attributed. Um, they often weren't told that at the end of this COVID period, there's an expectation that either the amount owing will be paid in full, that's the arrears, so what was not paid, or that their overall monthly mortgage payments were actually going to go up to account for what wasn't paid. Now, if you couldn't pay it before and your situation hasn't changed a lot, you're not going to be able to do that going forward. So we expect a bit of an influx from people who are now going to hear from their banks saying it's time to, to start paying and they don't know what they're going to do. Some of the banks have already said that they're willing to look, particularly um, Commonwealth Bank have certainly come out, the big banks come out and said they're prepared to do what's called capitalising arrears and consider that, which would be great. Um, it is not in the bank's interest to kick you out of your, cap, your house. That is really very much a final stage. Um, when they have, think that they have absolutely no chance of getting any money. I think they appreciate that um, if you're on a mortgage, they don't want a whole lot of houses that they have to sell. Um, that's an extra hassle for them. So they would actually prefer to work with you for solutions. We don't want to see people who have mortgages um, find themselves without accommodation because the simple fact is in this current market, to rent is actually more expensive than to have a mortgage. And that includes when you um, talk about rates and insurance and so on, you still actually end up financially ahead than if you are renting. So again, we've had moratoriums in the past, uh, certainly with mortgages, they will not halt interest on that. So that's something that you always have to, to think about. 
Um, you can talk to banks about hardship payment arrangements, which means a reduced payment over a period of time, whatever it is that you think you might need in order to get back on your feet. Um, good example is when there's some sort of illness and people just know that for a period of time they are not going to be able, they're not going to have the same income. Um, there are options where you can talk to banks about interest only options. Um, basically, it means that you're, the, the overall amount that you've borrowed has will remain the same. But if it's what you need to do to get you through some sort of hump period and keep that roof over your head, because you're all going to have equity in your houses and it's best to maintain that as much as possible because that's your investment in the future as well. And that's the why, reason why most people have also or choose to go into to buying homes where they can and save for it to begin with because there is, is capital growth over the years. Um, one of the things that can be done at the moment, and uh, this will change for different people depending on what your current um, mortgage is looking like, but um, because of the um, Reserve Bank not changing the mortgage rates, they are, or sorry, the cash rates, Mortgages are so low um, at the moment and it can be worth looking at options for changing. Now, of course, you have to check whether there's exit fees. If you're already in a situation where you're still on a fixed interest rate, there is more likely to be exit fees. But certainly I've seen out there rates which are under 2% fixed for four years. Um, and they're in, the average beforehand was usually around three and a half, four, four and a half percent. Over the life of the loan, um, one interest, one percent interest, two percent interest um, makes a huge difference in terms of what you will be forking out. It might even give you the potential to put a little bit more in and pay it off faster. Now, I mentioned earlier about capitalising the arrears. Basically what that is, and we will see probably more of this happening, and we'll be talking to banks a lot more about this as this COVID moratorium period ends, is you take that lump sum amount that has accrued over the moratorium period and in effect add it to the end of the loan. So yes, it extends the life of it, but it means that here and now you are not going to be paying more than you were before, which will is what is actually expected at the moment of um, people. And as I said, if you couldn't pay it before, you're not going to be able to pay it going forward. And if you'd had trouble, you're better off having what money you can in your pocket rather than theirs. doesn't mean that you can't change things going forward or change, start paying more. Um, it just means that you're getting through and getting by. Uh, one thing to look at often if you suddenly fall into hardship, like you lose your job, is to see whether there is loan insurance. Um, that's almost like income protection. Um, if when you got your loan you weren't working, there are some people on Centrelink who have still been able to get loans. If you have loan insurance on your mortgage, then you shouldn't have it actually there. You shouldn't be paying for it because if something were to happen, they will come back to you and deny that claim. And that's what we call junk insurance. And we have been speaking to banks about that. We have, on behalf of some clients, managed to get the amount that they have paid thus far actually paid back to them because they shouldn't have been sold it in the first place. But if you were working at the time and suddenly find yourself out of work or illness or whatever, um, if you have loan insurance, and a lot of people don't know whether they do or not, um, it's worthwhile asking um, because that may actually cover your costs and they're not going to tell you about it. They're not automatically going to apply it. It will be up to you to get in contact with the creditor um, to see if it's there and available to you. Now, if you're over 60 um, and you're having trouble, there are the options of reverse mortgages and home reversion. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically it is how over a period of time you sell back or use equity in your property um, to stay there. And it can be good for some in that they are not paying a mortgage. Um, the downside, of course, is that you lose equity in your house. 
Uh, some people don't care about that. They're not worried about what they pass on to the next generation, and that's fine. Um, but one of the things that you do have to be very clear on is that you have enough equity so that you cover the period um, that you need to uh, so that you don't find that you end up running out of money. Um, in terms of local government rates, if you're not able to pay for them, um, a lot of the councils are having a lot of pressure on them at the moment. Certainly the Victorian Ombudsman is about to put out a report because there's no consistency between the councils about how they deal with it. But in general, the sort of things that we do is look at payment plans, usually for 12 months. Um, we also look at, and you can approach them yourselves about that, that if you are diligent for those 12 months in paying whatever it amount it is that you can afford, and again, you have to go and tell them what you can afford, um, that we can look at having the removal of the interest that has been attributed. Um, if you are going to sell your property, irrespective of whether you're buying or whatever your circumstances are, it is possible to go to the bank, or sorry, the local government in the short term and defer paying your rates um, just so that you have the money here and now because the reality is the the government local government is going to get their money in the end um, selling a house the time between when you sell or even decide to sell and settle is not that long um, it is not likely to be as long as a year's worth of rates and that is not a huge amount of money and they will get it from the capital from the sale of the house so they can usually be sympathetic to that. So there's some of the things that we talk about. Now, superannuation. Um, again, it's not about wealth accumulation that I talk about. It's about hardship you've seen or maybe heard about in the last 12 months. Um, because of COVID, they've had two lots of early release, $10,000 each, um, that were allowed. A lot of people accessed that. Um, and uh, a lot of people used it for paying off debt. Um, if they wish to do that, of course, that's their prerogative, but a lot of them have not known about the services that financial counsellors offer, and there are other solutions. And in case of paying off debt, we would prefer that people don't dip into superannuation because that is, is your future. Um, but if it has to be, then, you know, sometimes people have to do that. And, that's one of the options that we do present to people. Um, there's a number of ways that you can apply for early release of superannuation. The most common one that we deal with is on grounds of severe financial hardship, and that's done through Centrelink or um, Services Australia. Some of the qualifying things are that you have to be on um, Centrelink payments for 26 weeks continuously. Um, the maximum amount that you can take out is $10,000 per annum. It is important to note that those, unlike the COVID ones from last year, are actually taxed at 22%. Now, that amount you may get some or all of back at the end of the financial year. It's, it's considered income, so it's part of what you've got to put in in your tax return at the end of the financial year. The other thing to think about is because it is considered income, it may affect the Centrelink amount that you get because a lot of them are indexed to income. So that's an important consideration. The other um, reason is through compassionate grounds. Um, that's usually done through the ATO. Um, one of the reasons is that um, you've got imminent, imminent foreclosure on your mortgage for whatever reasons. Um, people often think that that means they can take out as much as their mortgage is worth and in effect pay off their house. No, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, in that situation, all you can ask for is maximum 12 months of the interest plus three months repayments. Um, so it is designed to basically save the house, but they won't approve it if they think um, your house is still going to be um, foreclosed upon like if they think that you're not going to be able to maintain the payments that your house is still at risk it will be deemed um, an inappropriate uh, measure to release superannuation to in effect have it wasted um, 
and only saved the house for a couple of months. Um, other reasons are for medical treatment, um, transport, care, accommodating people who have a disability. Uh, that requires, of course, a lot of medical support letters, but that's not to say that it can't be done. Um, and that's also for situations where you can't access other things like NDIS packages and so on. So it has to be quite specialised. And of course, then there is the, the horrible situation of terminal illness. Um, the only other thing I'd mention there is if you get into hardship, instead of withdrawing from your superannuation, most people don't realise that they also have insurance within their superannuation. So sometimes that's um, income insurance, uh, sometimes it's life insurance, but more often than not, there's total and permanent disability. So if you find yourself unable to work, and most importantly, it's not never be able to work, people get this, this mixed up, it is not work in the same capacity as you were before. So you end up with, say, some physical in um, injury where um, you're not able to go back and work in the same job, in the same capacity. It might mean that you have to do reduced hours. Um, it might mean that you have to retrain. Um, most people have TPD, total and permanent disability, and it is possible to go in and make an application for that. And that's certainly worthwhile investigating, at least asking of your superannuation fund um, before you go in and um, actually dip into your superannuation and, and deplete that. And to give you an example, um, this is two different um, scenarios which have actually been put out by two different superannuation funds as a result of the COVID early release of superannuation. So it's the long-term effect. And you can see here from the numbers um, that there's quite a lot of money that a mere ten dollars or $20,000 out of your super, superannuation will have. And that's due to the accumulated interest over time, particularly for the young people who are the ones who are most inclined to take money out. They haven't necessarily thought far ahead. But here you've got um, at least one company saying that that could affect their um, total amount to 66,000 and that's in today's terms. So total value of 66,000 less for their retirement. Um, equally from the, the other fund on the left-hand side, um, if younger person, the difference could be they're saying here anywhere between 35 and 70,000. Of course, that depends on how the fund performs over time. Um, the older you are, closer you are to retirement, of course, the less of an impact that will have. But nevertheless, it's money that you didn't necessarily need to take out of superannuation. Maybe you did. Uh, it just depends. It's a personal decision and that's something we talk through with people. Um, budgeting, really, really important. And that's something that is not static. It moves with time as your situation changes as you buy a house, as you sell a house, as you get married, maybe separate, as you have children, as you move into retirement, um, the situation as you get a raise or you find yourself being made redundant, um, as your money situation changes, so does um, the need for doing a budget. Um, just so that you know where you stand, certainly if you're going to talk to um, creditors about hardship, it's really important to do one of these beforehand so that you know your financial position, you're in a better situation for saying exactly what it is that you can afford without putting yourself into further hardship. A really great site to look at, which is um, managed by ASIC, which is the Australian Securities and Investments Authority. <laughs> Sorry about that, I just had to think twice. Um, it's moneysmart.gov.au and they have great, easy to use templates um, for budgeting. Um, they also have information about managing debt, about taxation, about superannuation. Um, and that's a great place to, to start if you um, just want to, to get some information and, and start doing some budgeting for yourself. Um, in terms of just some generic, 
Um, general things going forward, if you are on any sort of Centrelink pension, there are a number of concessions that are available to you um, with regards to utilities. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily know about these, but one of the ones is the Utility Relief Grant, and that is a contribution of up to $650, excuse me, per utility every two years. It can be taken in, in multiple in amounts. Um, and you can get that for gas, for electricity, and also for water, and that's $650 for each. There are also relief grants for non-mains. Um, so if you're in that situation, please speak to your utility company. If you are a property that only has electricity, then the amount, of course, is, is double, doubled. So it's the equivalent of the electricity and gas, so that's $1,300. If you're in a situation where you use, for whatever reason, a lot of electricity or gas, there is the excess energy consumption. So that is an additional um, concession on top of whatever you may be getting. Make sure utility companies do have your Centrelink number so that they can apply those um, basic concessions. Uh, for electricity, just in this state, there's a thing called the medical cooling concession. If um, you have some sort of condition, which means that you might need to use more air conditioning, it covers the months from November to March. And you could still apply now if you think that that would apply to you because they can backdate it. Um, it's a form that you can get from your utility company. It will need to be um, signed by your doctor. I can't say exactly what would get you the concession, but a good example that I often talk about is people who have fibromyalgia, um, because of course that's a, a condition where people do have problems regulating their own temperature. Um, the areas that we're looking at, and particularly Whittlesea, we're very lucky to have Yarra Valley Water as our provider. They have been at the forefront of all um, creditors, all of the people that we're talking about in terms of hardship. Um, and one of the things that they have is a medical concession as well. Um, you can get a medical support letter and send that to them and they will consider it for additional concessions. They also have um, a concession for large families, so sort of seven plus people living in a house. In terms of the cooling concessions, it doesn't need to be, or any sort of medical concession, it doesn't need to be the name on the um, bill, it just has to be someone within the house who has some sort of condition, which means the household as a whole is affected. Um, the other thing that's worthwhile thinking about is as of today, it's an additional COVID release. Um, it will be available to people for the next 12 months. Basically, anyone who has um, an eligible concession card, their name is the one that's on the bill. There is a single payment of $250 um, towards the electricity bill, but it will be paid directly to you in your account. You can apply for that at the website and more information is there. You just have to have a copy of your electricity bill, which you can upload. It can all be done online. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention was just briefly to talk about a big problem at the moment, and it's become an even larger problem during COVID and that is financial um, abuse and how it constitutes family violence. Um, unfortunately, we do see a lot of that. Um, we've seen a lot of it, particularly out in our area. Um, it is the cause of the breakdown of a lot of families and we will see that that's also a reason why a lot of people end up losing their houses because they have to sell as a marriage breaks down. Um, there is help out there. Uh, it should be probably, if you're experiencing this, your first point of call for um, the North East. There is a group called the Orange Door who then link you in with various services and they link um, people into financial counsellors. Um, there's 1800 Respect as well. Same thing, they will link you in with a range of different services. If financial abuse, because a lot of people think family violence is really just physical, it's not, it's psychological, um, it's verbal, 
and of course it's financial so if someone is taking control of your finances and that's what it comes down to it's not a case of one person taking responsibility for paying the bills but if you're in a situation where you have no control and no say um, if someone's watching what you do if you have to account for all of your spending um, it is a control mechanism um, and a lot of people find that when they come out of an abusive situation, um, they'll say they walked away with nothing. But no, quite often they walked away worse than that because um, they were walked away with debt. And that can be really an important time to talk to financial counsellors uh, because there is a lot that we can do. All of the creditors are required to have family violence policies and take that into consideration when we talk to them or anyone talks to them and um, look at tailored solutions. So just something to keep in mind, something that we like to, to bring up, whether it applies to you or not. Um, it's good information also to pass on to anyone if you think they are experiencing problems. Um, just finally, there's some details there about where you can contact us. Our Intag um, line is 1800 685 682. Now, as I said, uh, we all work on catchment areas around Australia. Ours is Whittlesea, Banyul, Nilambic, Darabin and Yarra. Um, if you would like to, to tell friends anywhere about financial counselling and get them to link in, the best first point of call is the National Debt Helpline. It's um, manned by financial counsellors, they can give some immediate advice and then they will send out warm referrals to the nearest financial counselling service wherever that is in Australia. So 1800 007 007 and I've also put down um, the details for Whittlesea Community Connections. Thank you very much again for organising today. It's been a pleasure talking to you all. I believe there's going to be a um, questionnaire that they would like you to complete after this. But at this stage, um, if there are any questions from anyone, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, um, Melissa. I just let you all know that I've unmuted people. So if you do want to ask a question, um, please go ahead now or you can type it in the chat box if you're more comfortable asking questions in that way. Um, but yeah, just feel, to unmute, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, Melissa. Hi there. Um, so I work for Catholic Care and I have a lot of clients that require financial counseling is mm -hmm. there like um like a referral form if i go to the website or do we just call on behalf of our clients i don't know if you touched on this and i missed it sorry <laughs> yeah um we do actually like um or encourage people to give us a call themselves so we would like um our name number and so on given out. Um, you can, of course, do a referral. You can um, get on the phone and uh, talk to one of the financial counsellors at Uniting Kildonan. The phone will always be picked up by a financial counsellor. Mm -hmm. The reason, main reason why I, I appreciate that some of people will not feel comfortable doing that themselves. We do like to get out there and, and show that we, we are normal human beings and that we're not that scary. Um, and the main reason is that we want people to engage. We find that if a person is not making that first step themselves, and you probably see it as well in your job, um, they're not necessarily going to, to follow through. Um, and we like to get people engaged in the process as much as possible. So if you can give out our number, that's great. Um, yeah. If they're not prepared to do it themselves, by all means, give us a call and we'll work together to get them on board. Perfect. Thank you. I'm also more than happy to send out flyers. So, um, yeah, uh, Martha, I can um, send through a flyer for Kildonan as well. But that's um, often what we do at Whittlesea Community Connections as well. well that would be great. Thank you. Because we yeah. usually refer, like, to the National Debt helpline 
Um, yeah, but I'm finding that I think they're very busy at the moment as well. I think everyone is, uh, but yeah, it's good to have like another source of referral. Um, yeah, for our clients. Yeah, absolutely. If you're in our catchment area, refer them directly to us. It does save um, one step in the process. I just put the National Debt Helpline there because if you fall out of our area, then um, it needs to go through the National Debt Helpline or we will refer on who is in the particular area 